Whoa, that was really bad. C G Q plus. All right, so we haven't done one of these videos in a really long time, so we have a lot of stuff, so we don't really have time uh, to BS before getting right into this. Uh, I'll warn people in advance, a lot of what I have here to show are little cars like Hot Wheels and whatnot, so what I'm going to do is we're going to go through all of like the gaming stuff and the stuff that uh, you guys sent in, postcards, and then at the end... Uh, I'm going to show the stuff that I brought back uh, from my trip, which really isn't too much stuff. And then I'll go through all the cars and whatnot. And that way, uh, people that don't care about that stuff, uh, that you'll know that then you can go ahead and uh, just uh, just turn off the video. So uh, first, we'll just do postcards. We don't really have that many of them, so I'm not going to do my little routine of uh, sprinkling them around. And we'll just uh, get them all done at once. Uh, this is another postcard from uh, William in Taipei City, Taiwan. Uh, he always sends us really cool postcards. As I've said, I say this every time I show uh, one of his postcards. But uh, uh, aside from being a Discord chat regular, uh, William and I are sort of like pen pals now. So that's pretty cool. Uh, this next one comes from Adam, who is normally in Kentucky, but went on a vacation to New York City and sent us a postcard. So, uh, and if you follow on Twitter, he put on here, uh, I already have a, a postcard, don't worry about sending me one. So uh, I, I just sent him a postcard and said, oh, I'll worry about it. Uh, next we've got here from, uh, oh, from Josh. All right, from Josh in Carterville, Illinois, another Discord. Uh, Discord regular and uh, live stream regular. Uh, finally sent us a postcard from Metropolis, Indiana, and it says, home of Superman. Is that really true? I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, in any case, that's a cool postcard. Uh, next, this is actually what it looks like right now uh, where I live. Um, this one is not signed, so uh, not a name or an address. So uh, if this is your postcard and you want me to send you back a postcard, uh, you can shoot me an email. I don't. Maybe this was just meant to be uh, anonymous. I don't know. And uh, he said, isn't it sad that our generation really, all our generation really knows is commodities, commercialism, and consumption? Uh, some say the 70s were the beginning of the decline of America. I mean, I think that uh, commercialism goes back to at least the 50s um, when it became rampant, probably before that. But I, I mean, I think it's just human nature. We like to collect things and amass things. So, uh, you know, consumerism is just, I think, part of human nature. But uh, anyway, that's a lot of uh, sunflowers there, which, uh, you know, I've been going road cycling a lot lately and I'm cycling through like fields of, uh, of sunflowers, which is unfortunate because uh, the farmers have to put bee boxes uh, along the road where the sunflowers are. And uh, I've been stung by bees a couple of times while cycling, uh, including uh, one time in the face and my face swelled up real bad. So that sucked. Uh, this next one, uh, I'll just say the postcard comes from Riverside, California. The person does not want me to, it says don't share. So I don't know if that means don't share your name or don't share what you wrote. So I'm just not going to share either one. I'll just show the postcard, uh, which says barista. So, which I've turned into a bit of a barista here at home. Uh, I've been making cappuccinos cause I got a Nespresso machine. So, um, I don't know. I don't think those things really save you any money to be honest. Uh, cause I drink way too many of them now. Uh, next, uh, this one comes from John from Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina, which is a pretty awesome name. I wouldn't mind living in a place called Kill Devil Hills. Uh, he didn't really have anything to say. He just gave me his return address, which is totally fine. But, uh, the postcard itself is, uh, it says OB, OBX. What is that? Oh, Outer Banks is what that's called. And apparently that is a vacation destination for people in the region. And then uh, the last postcard we have here comes from Adam in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Somebody out there can correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like this is the first postcard we've gotten from Mississippi. I don't remember sending anybody else a postcard in Mississippi. So uh, he says how much he likes the show, which I really appreciate. And um, yeah, he, he, just, he, wrote, he wrote some really nice – he wrote so much stuff on the postcard – that he had to put it in an envelope. So uh, I always love that. I always read anything anybody sends me. I always read it. Uh, sorry, we had one more uh, from uh, Evan in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, that's a pretty cool uh, postcard. So 
Thank you, Evan. Uh, I just realized I haven't responded to yours yet. So uh, that one and this package are the two things where I still need to send you guys postcards or uh, otherwise address what you sent. So uh, everybody else should have gotten a postcard back already. So I got this uh, bubble ope, which is uh, how cool people say bubble envelope, from uh, Joseph Nocera Entertainment in Amesbury, Massachusetts. And he sent us a postcard from Newburyport. So maybe that's nearby. I don't really... Uh, oh, he explained it in here, I guess, a little bit. So, um, but I'm not going to... I won't read that to you guys. And then he sent me a couple of uh, his business cards. He's a singer-songwriter, so... Uh, isn't that cool? Um, I sing while I'm driving sometimes, but uh, I've never written a song. He wrote me a letter here, and I'm just, I guess the only person that cares about this is Joseph. Uh, Joseph, uh, I haven't obviously answered your question yet, but I'm just going to email you to answer. He, he had a question about, um, like, setting up recorders and whatnot. Uh, and then he sent me a copy of his album, so check that out. Um, that's pretty neat. You know, I have people send me artwork in the form of, like, drawings and whatnot, but this is the first time somebody has sent me a physical copy of their music. So obviously it's still shrink wrapped. I haven't listened to it yet, but uh, I'll pop it in, in the car and, uh, and check it out. So thank you, Joseph. I appreciate you sharing that. So uh, that's it for uh, postcards and envelopes and whatnot. Uh, but I do have a lot of stuff that people sent in, uh, you know, that, that doesn't fall into that category. And uh, the first one I'm going to show off that's pretty cool. So this is not from a fan of the show. So maybe I'm kind of jumping the gun on this one, but but that's okay. Um, you know, I've talked about before, I think when I did the video about my um, PlayStation collection, I, I talked about how much I love the NHL games, NHL 97, 98. Uh, 99 was okay. But uh, I really loved NHL 98. And uh, one of the reasons that I loved it was that it had live play-by-play uh, -play and commentary. NHL 97 really didn't. It had John Davidson, who would do, like, a little intro before each period started and then, like, after the period was over, I think. But it was all, you know, it was all really generic, obviously. And I think he was also kind of like the arena announcer, you know? Like, he, you know, his voice saying, like, you know, Red Wings goal scored by number 91, Sergey Fedorov, you know, so whatever, but, uh, oops, sorry, but, uh, 98 was cool. Cause like I said, it had actual play by play and color commentary. Yell gets shoved by Larionov. Kozlov passes to Larionov. Kozlov shoots, moved ahead by Krupp. That's gotta hurt. Lacroix flicks it. Skate save by Vernon. And that's the end of the first period. And uh, the two guys that did that were, uh, I believe his name was Jim Hewson, who now works for like CBC or TSN or something. And the other guy was Daryl Ray. And somehow it came to my attention that Daryl Ray is active on Twitter. And so I don't know what made me decide to do this, but I just reached out to him and I, I said, hey, Daryl, is there any way I could get you to sign my copy of NHL 98? And um, so we worked it out so that he, he would. And so I sent him uh, the instruction manual from, from NHL 98, and he signed it and sent it back. I don't know if you can read that. It says, uh, Chris, play well, and then is signed by, uh, by Daryl Ray. And he actually sent me a little note here, too. So uh, he's now, uh, uh, is he the play-by-play -play guy or the color commentator? I'm not sure which. For the Dallas Stars. And so he actually sent me a note on like Dallas Stars, like it's not, let, I mean, it's letterhead, but this is, this is like a, a notepad you have on your desk. It says, you know, from the desk of Daryl Ray. And uh, he says, Chris doing NHL 98 and 99 with EA Sports up in Vancouver was a labor of love and a real education. So that was, uh, you know, EA, EA Canada did uh, NHL 98, 99, also did 94 for the Super Nintendo, not the Genesis. Uh, games have come a long, long way since then. Appreciate your interest and note. All the best to you, Daryl Ray. So how cool is that? So, um, so yeah. All right, that's enough of that one. Uh, what next? Uh, oh, uh, well, that one's kind of car. I'm saving all the car stuff for later. So, um, oh, we can get to, so I got a pretty big package here. So, uh, just a little bit of background about this next package. Let me drag it closer. Okay, so I got this, like, email out of the blue from this guy, Ed. Uh, you know, I'm not going to give Ed's, Ed's last name, of course. Uh, 
Ed sent me this email and said that he had some magazines that he had found uh, in his house or something uh, that he was, you know, thought I might be interested in. And he took pictures of all the magazines and, and sent me a list of what they were. And there was, let's just say there were 15 of them. It was something like that. It was like 12 to 15. And uh, I only really wanted four of them. And so I, I, I just told him, like, here, these are the four that I'm interested in. But, you know, he, he was, I think, looking towards more, like, offloading the entire lot of them. And uh, so he, he gave me a price for all of them. And I just, I emailed him back and just basically said, I really only want these four. The, the other ones were just too new for my interest. They were like from the early 2000s. And uh, so I made him an offer, a per magazine offer for the four that I wanted that was a little bit higher than the per magazine offer that he sent me for the whole thing. And I just said, well, and I think I offered him, it was basically like $5 per issue is what I offered him, uh, plus shipping. And, uh, so he just said that, you know, well, how about, uh, he said, I'll just send you the stuff. And he said, I had some other stuff he wanted to send me. And he, he basically just said like, instead of me paying him, how about I take the money that I had offered to pay him and, uh, and donate it to my local food bank. Um, oh boy, I keep hitting the mic. Uh, so that's what I did. Uh, there's a, a local grocery store where you can make donations to the food bank right at the cash register. And um, so, you know, normally they're trying, oh, would you like to donate $1 to the county food bank? And I said, uh, no, actually, I want to donate $25. And so the lady was like, oh, my goodness. But I didn't tell her the whole story, you know. Um, who's texting me? And um, so I, I did that and I took a picture of the receipt and I sent it to Ed just so he didn't think I was, you know, uh, pulling his chain or whatever, pulling his leg. And, uh, so, so he sent me all this stuff here and, uh, so I got the four magazines, but as I said, he mentioned he had some other stuff that he had around that he was kind of waiting to send to me. So, uh, I figured we could check out all of it. It's kind of an interesting mishmash, but it's all very cool stuff. So, uh, the first thing, uh, these are a couple of, couple of easy ones. Uh, so I don't know the story behind this. Maybe somebody can tell me it's very cool. Uh, what is that? It's gotta be like more than three inches was that four inches maybe i don't know it's a so it's an iron on patch you know and it's it's sonic but obviously uh stylized uh sonic iron on patch and i just thought that was cool i don't know if that i, I don't know i just i have no idea where that would have come from but it looks neat uh and then he sent me uh just this one uh sega like pack-in poster like this would have come with a game uh that you bought and um Oh, this is what he might have been asking me about. So, so it's Jurassic Park. He was asking me if 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 he had sent me like this movie sign or something, but I think maybe he was talking about this, but maybe he wasn't. Ed, is this what you were asking me about? Because uh, so this is a like I said a Sega poster, and then on the back, it's got uh, you know all these other games. So I, I always like looking at these because then you kind of try to figure out like when about it's from. Um, does it? Well, it says 93 on it, but, like, it's got Streets of Rage 2 on here, uh, Cyborg Justice. Uh, anyway, uh, cool poster. So, sorry, Ed, if, that, if that's what you were asking about, then, yes, you did send it to me. And if you want it back or something, uh, let me know. And then, um, so I remember these. Uh, I, I actually bought some. I don't have any of them anymore, but I definitely bought some of these. Uh, he sent me this pack of Topps Batman cards. Uh, and this this was uh, when the original Batman movie came out in 89. Uh, there was uh, so much merchandising that came out uh, when that movie came out. And so one of the things uh, that they had were these uh, Topps uh, licensed cards. So this is a, a still sealed pack. I was thinking about opening them on camera, but you know, I've got like some other stuff. Like I have a sealed uh, pack of uh, 87 Topps baseball cards. And uh, so I think I'm just going to put this pack next to that pack uh, and not open it. So uh, sorry. And then uh, the next thing we got here, we got a couple of Lego items. Uh, the first thing is, uh, well, they kind of came off. Well, here, let me see if I can see if I can fix it real quick. I don't know if this was an official set uh, or not. I mean, I don't really care because it's it's cool either way. But. Well, let me get these. I don't know if I can get this guy standing in there or not, so I'll just try to hold him up a little bit. But so it's it's two lion knights in uh, in this little boat, 
And uh, so obviously, well, this between this and the next thing, it's obviously Ed watched my um, uh, my video about my castle uh, Legos and decided to send me that here. Now I got him standing up. There you go. Uh, yeah, obviously you watched that video, and I guess that inspired him to send me that. So that's pretty cool. So I'm going to put that uh, just with the rest of my castle Legos. And then the other thing that he sent me, so I don't remember. I mean, I'd have to go back and watch uh, watch the episode. Uh, I don't recall mentioning this, but maybe I did. So uh, I never had this set back in the day. It's uh, Black, the Black Falcon's Fortress. It was a really cool Lego set uh, that I never had, but somehow I have it now. And uh, the only thing I can guess is that I must have gotten it like in a lot of Legos that I bought on Craigslist or something. Um, Cause sometimes I would buy like a, a whole bin of Legos that would come with like a stack of instruction manuals. And then I would use those instruction manuals to build the sets out of the Legos I bought. And I got some of my older sets that way. But uh, so I have, there's at least one piece that only ever came with this one set and I have it. So somehow I came across the pieces needed to, uh, to make the Black Falcon's Fortress. And, uh, but I didn't have the instruction manual, and so I don't know, I don't know if I said something or something. Uh, but he sent me, uh, he sent me the instruction manual, and uh, and I also didn't know this. So this is not an original instruction manual from the original Black Falcon's Fortress. You see how the the number there is one zero zero three nine, and then on the back it has um, the Lego website. And that's because uh, back around this time, Lego actually re-released some of their classic sets. And that's uh, funny because those re-released classic sets are just as collectible as their original counterparts. So, uh, but I didn't know. I know they, they re-released the Guarded Inn because that's a set that I really, really want. And, uh, but I guess they re-released this one too because that's what the, I mean, it's the exact same instruction manual. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just, I didn't, I didn't remember talking about this. Uh, on the episode, but I guess I, I must have, but I just thought, uh, that was, that was just really, really thoughtful, Ed. I thought that was the coolest thing, uh, that you sent me that. Uh, so thank you. And then, uh, I'll show the magazines he sent me too, but there's, there's one other thing. Um, so he sent me, uh, this, and I, I had never heard of these, uh, until I saw this one. He sent me this boxed mini vid break free. So this and this, he put a little note on here, but I'll just explain first of all. So uh, this is one of these vacuum fluorescent display games, like very similar to the little Coleco tabletop uh, arcade games uh, that came out around the same time. And uh, there were four of these, these mini vid uh, uh, games. And I only know that because they're on the back of the box. And I did a little bit of uh, rudimentary research. Uh, there's Sea Battle, Dodge City Gunfight, Space War and then Break Free, which is what this one is. And uh, Ed put a little post-it note. Uh, oh, sorry. First, check it out. Uh, Toys R Us uh, price tag. And this was originally $34.97. And this would have been in like the the late 70s. Uh, he says it's from 1979. So let's just, let's assume this was on clearance like the next year, maybe 1980 or 81. Uh, that's still over $100 in uh, 2019 uh, dollars. So that's pretty nuts. But uh, but yeah, anyway, so he put this note on here. It says, Chris, this doesn't work. Wires need reconnecting. Hilarious lame 1979 home video. You can trash it, but I wanted to send it to you for a chuckle. So yeah, I guess he just wanted me to sort of uh, uh, check it out and then throw it in the garbage. Uh, so here, So here it is. So it's a two-player only game. So here's your uh, vacuum fluorescent display. So this is actually glass because th that little thing, the, the, the screen, if you want to call it that, inside of there is inside of a vacuum. So that's actually a little uh, uh, glass enclosure that, that's been like totally uh, evacuated of, of air. And, uh, and then it's got, uh, you can play two-player simultaneous. It's got like three games built into it. But, uh, but yeah, anyway, so the thing is, Ed, is that like, I actually kind of like stuff like this. And, um, so instead of, uh, trashing it, uh, I fixed it. So uh, it's going to be hard to show because of the glare there, but so you can see that's like a breakout game. 
So you use the controls here to uh, move the move your paddle up and down. So I'm trying to play it in the screen of my camera. So, but anyway, I mean, it's just really cool. And that's just one of the three built-in games. I mean, I guess it's not fun by today's standards. Although I don't know why not. It's just a breakout game. Uh, and it's cool that you can you can play two player because there's there's like a pong type game you can play, uh, except that you're like guarding the stuff behind you. Like there's bricks behind your paddle that you're guarding from the other player. And uh, I don't know. I just I've had other stuff like this growing up, and so like I said, I thought this was cool. And so when he told me it was broken and to trash it, I just figured, well, let me at least open it up and see what's wrong with it. And um, it was about ten minutes in my garage with a soldering iron. Uh, to get it working. So, uh, well, and I had to go get a nine volt battery, but, but yeah, so this is not going in the garbage can. Uh, I'll be keeping it and maybe even playing it every once in a while. But so thanks, Ed. I thought this was really cool. And uh, so then last, last, I'll show you the magazines that I got off of him. So I, I should have put these in chronological order. April, May, yeah. Okay, here we go. So now they're in chronological order. So, hey, so this first one, uh, this will be uh, Mike Mike McFly, if you're watching. Uh, you know, Mike is also a um, live stream and Discord regular. I got the, uh, these are all Electronic Gaming Monthly, by the way. This one is from April of 1994, and uh, Mike's going to like it because it is Beavis and Butthead uh, on the cover. Uh, because, you know, they turned it into a video game. So, uh, there you go. Uh, April 94, EGM. What else we got in here? Sonic Drift, Outrunners, Slam Masters, Incredible Hulk, Fighters History, Streets of Rage 3, Super Mario Land 3, Lethal Enforcers, and Mortal Kombat 2. So that one's pretty cool. Then we, I got the one from the next month, May of 94. And uh, the cover story there is Exclusive Fighting Games Spectacular. And then there's Ryu from uh, the Street Fighter 2 series. Uh, on the front. First info on Sega's 32-bit Genesis Supercharger, uh, the 32X, and Nintendo's uh, Game Boy slash Super NES adapter. So I didn't know that the um, Super Game Boy came out that late, but I guess that kind of makes sense. But uh, yeah, so I got, keep hitting the mic. Uh, so there's that one. Uh, and then we're going to jump ahead uh, two and a half years about, actually, to November of 1996. And uh, here we've got uh, Twisted Metal 2 on the cover. Uh, again, fighting game special. I didn't ask for that on purpose. World exclusive Street Fighter 3. First info, Castlevania 5, Mech Warrior 2, and ID4. What's ID4? I'm sure I'll remember. I'll figure out what that is as soon as this video is over. EGM Unearths Resident Evil 2. That's pretty cool. And Twisted Metal 2 is on the cover, if I didn't say that already. So um, that one's pretty awesome. And then this last one... Uh, the, this last one I got is, uh, I'm sure, for very obvious reasons. Uh, that is the November uh, 98, and that has uh, Sonic Adventure uh, on the cover. So pretty crazy. It's November of 98, which is, uh, I believe, quite a bit before Sonic Adventure had even come out in Japan, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, it definitely was not a launch title in Japan. I don't remember when it actually came out. Uh, inside how to buy your own coin op uh, and that again that's in uh, November of 98 so that's pretty cool and that's just a really cool looking cover uh, in my opinion but uh, you know since I'm working on the Dreamcast launch episode like that one really caught my eye but uh, like I said the other um, the other ones that he had were just all like after 2000 and I'm just not really interested in stuff like that unless it's like specifically dealing with like a console launch or uh, or some particular game that I'm really interested in there were two more things inside the box. I know I'm not wearing the same shirt now because I, I already changed because I was getting ready to edit. And there were two more things inside the box from Ed that I didn't see because everything else was sitting on top of the box. Uh, the first thing is a boxed uh, Sega Saturn ST Pro Pad, which it's, you know, it's funny because the box is pretty beat up, but I would swear that uh, the controller itself is brand new. And uh, it's actually a pretty nice controller. It's got a really good D-pad on it. But uh, it's got like independent uh, turbo button, uh, turbo functions, turbo and auto functions for uh, all six of the face buttons. So uh, so that's pretty cool. So I actually already have my uh, Saturn set up over here uh, because I've been using it for the show. So uh, so I can check that out. 
And then uh, the other thing, which it's funny, I forgot about this because I even emailed Ed and asked him about it, is uh, some of the stuff came wrapped up in this old PlayStation bag. And I asked him, like, where? what's the story behind this? Like, where did it come from? Like, it's not big enough for a system to have gone in. And, I mean, I guess you could see, you know, Sony sending a bunch of these to, like, EB Games or something just to give out uh, or just to use as shopping bags. But uh, so I was just curious. And he said it was some friend of his uh, got it from, like, the Sony booth at E3 or something. Like, they were giving away, like, promo stuff, and they put it inside of a bag. So, um so anyway, that's that's really neat too. I, I don't know why I get a kick out of stuff like that. So uh, anyway, sorry Ed, that was two things that I forgot to show when I went through your stuff uh, initially, but through the power of editing, I can just slide it right in there. So uh, so yeah, now now back to the video. Well, all right. So so I really it, it bums me out when this happens. I feel like every time I make one of these videos, the very next day somebody sends me something where I'm just like, oh, you just missed the cutoff, and now you have to wait until the next time. So since the last time I made one of these, you know, pickups slash mail videos, uh, I've actually gotten not one but two packages from uh, our friend Marcelo down in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. So, um, so I'll show both of those. I'll try to do them in order here. So uh, yeah, I think this is the first one, and we have to get this stuff. Or did I already put it in the other one? Maybe I did. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. I think they're all over here. So. Um, so I'd never heard of this game. I don't, where did he say? I think he cut this out of a magazine or something. Uh, Ayrton Senna Kart Duel 2. Did that, I don't, that didn't come out here, but, uh, I think it, it seems like they're making it seem like it came out in Europe and in, in Brazil. So, uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but, uh, I'd like to track that game down and check it out, uh, to be honest. And then as Marcelo did with, um, uh, the other Ayrton Senna stuff that he sent me, uh, he sent me uh, translations of uh, of what it says on um, on this card, and then uh, you know, as usual, he sent me a nice letter. And um, so yeah, it never yeah he says never at least in the U.S. and he even said he'd never even heard of it. So, and it's funny he says I know this is nothing special. Well, but I think it's pretty darn cool. So it's um, it's special to me, Marcelo. So I really appreciate it. And then are they in here? He sent me... Re oh, yeah, yeah, here we go. Uh, so I've been kind of waiting because I want to put these on my car. But, you know, I was waiting to, to you know, make a video and show them. Uh, he says, I was shopping online the day before yesterday, and I found these cool Senna stickers, and I grabbed two sets, so I'm sending you one. I think they look nice if you stick them on the rear of your car, which is exactly what I'm going to do. So uh, these are like these stickers that you put on the inside of your windows. And uh, you see one of them is the classic uh, Senna S, uh, Senna logo, and the other one is uh, his autograph there. So I'm probably going to stick those in the back window, uh, either in the back window of my car or in the little tiny windows right behind the, um, the, the doors. So I don't know. In any case, I, I've been waiting to put these on. So Marcelo, thank you so much for all the cool uh, Senna stuff. Um, you know how much I love Senna stuff. So uh, yeah. Next, what else? Okay, I think I might only have one other thing that uh, somebody sent me that is not car related. And that one just came in today. So uh, this comes to us from Drew in uh, Sutherland, Australia. Is that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sutherland, New South Wales, Australia. Yeah. So uh, Drew is uh, Drewbo. Uh, he sent stuff before Drewbo. And uh, uh, Drubo definitely hangs out in the live stream chat sometimes, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, yeah, Drubo is also a, um, a Discord member. So, uh, and he sent me uh, this note. Normally, I don't read the notes, but this is just sort of, this note explains what's in the package here. Uh, I was recently in Tokyo and picked this up for you. Uh, he says it's the, it's the Japan-only version of whatever it is. It has English options, so you should be fine. Uh, and then, you know, hope you and your family are well. I am Drubo. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So, uh, and I, it's on cool paper. Somehow it's got like a Super Mario Brothers, like sort of watermark type thing uh, in the background, which is pretty neat. Uh, but what he sent me uh, is this. Uh, so it's for the Nintendo Switch. It's Capcom Belt Action Collection. I don't know why it's Belt Action Collection. But uh, so this is the Capcom Beat-Em-Up Collection, which I'm... I, 
you can buy this on the in U.S. Uh, in the Nintendo online store, whatever whatever it's called. Um, but I think it, it's only um, a physical release in Japan. I could be wrong about that. But, you know, I always prefer a physical release. So uh, that's pretty cool. And the games that you get, I mean, you can see, maybe you can see on the back here, um, it, you get, like, what, seven games there? So you get, uh, uh, sorry, I'm old. Uh, the writing's really small. You get Final Fight, uh, The King of Dragons, which we just played on a live stream a couple weeks ago, Captain Commando, Knights of the Round, which we either played or we were going to play a few weeks ago. Something called Battle Circuit Powered Gear. Never, So I've never heard of a couple of these. I've never heard of Battle Circuit or Powered Gear. And then there's one of them that's just in Japanese, so I really have no idea what that is. But uh, we're going to fire up, fire it up and find out. So, I mean, I'm going to check this out on my own, but uh, this would also probably be a really cool thing to do on a live stream because that's more than enough game content to last us an entire live stream without having to actually physically change out the game in uh, in the Switch. So, uh, so Drew, thank you so much. Uh, this is really, really cool. This is my first uh, my first import Switch game, or even just my first import modern game of any type. I don't really usually try to collect um, import games, but for something like this, where it's the only way to get a physical release, uh, it's really awesome. So, so thank you very much, Drew. And uh, so, uh, what else do we have? I think, okay, so I think next we're going to have to just, I'm going to talk about a few uh, gaming items that I've picked up, and then we're going to just get into the, the, the crud that I brought back from my vacation and all the cars and whatnot. So, I've only got, I think, three things, well, four things really here to show. Recent things I've picked up or have arrived at my house. Uh, here's another one. So, sorry, I got five, I guess. So I've mentioned before, there's this little place that I go. It's like a consignment toy shop over in the Bay Area that I go uh, I go to anytime I happen to be in the area. And uh, I, I usually am able to walk out of there with at least one game. And uh, the game I got this time is uh, 1943, uh, The Battle of Midway. I was going to say The Battle for Midway. The Battle of Midway, uh, obviously, for the NES. So a uh, pretty cool shooter. I paid 12 bucks for it, which is not really cheap, but it's... Um, that's kind of the state of things these days. So it's certainly not highway robbery or anything. It's just, it's not like I got a deal, but um, yeah, I just thought it would be cool to have. I don't have 1942 or 1943, but if memory serves, I think this is the, the better game uh, by a long shot. And uh, then a couple things I got in the mail here. This one I got kind of a long time ago. And these are both uh, things to help enable piracy. Uh, the first one is this PSIO. Uh, and so what this is, is a, unfortunately you have to mod your console, which I didn't know when I pre-ordered this, but, uh, you can pop this into the expansion port on a, on a PS one and you can load games off of an SD card. So, uh, I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, I have a, a PlayStation with a chip in it already so that I can burn games. So, I mean, this isn't really that awesome to have. And, and once I found out that you had to mod your PlayStation, uh, that kind of killed my enthusiasm for it because now I'm going to have to have somebody mod my PlayStation because it looks like more of a mod than I'm really willing to try to do on my own. Just, you know, soldering to like little tiny legs on the, on chips and whatnot. Like I got big sausage fingers. And then the other thing I got here is, uh, and this is the second time that one of these is making an appearance on my show, is uh, the action replay cartridge for uh, Saturn. And the difference is, is that I bought this one because it had already been flashed and so that it was like a, a pseudo Saturn, which means that you can load uh, burned games. Uh, my other action replay, of course, is just a stock action replay. So this way you can burn a game. And as long as you have this in the uh, cartridge slot, it'll go ahead and boot it. So uh, and I needed that for some stuff I was doing for the show where uh, I needed to capture some gameplay footage. And I didn't want to have to buy the games. So um, so I got that. And then I think the last thing, I'm sure I have other stuff around here that I'm not even thinking about. But, uh, oh, no, I got two more things. So I picked this up. It's still in the box, so obviously I haven't done anything with it yet. But uh, I feel like Retrobit, you know, the company Retrobit has been kind of stepping up their game lately. And they came out with this uh, Nintendo 64 controller. But uh, for those of you that are familiar with it, it looks just like the Hori Mini Pad. Like, it looks exactly like the Hori Mini Pad. And uh, so I bought it just to check it out and see how it is. The Hori Mini Pad is a little bit small for my hands, but it's such a better controller. 
than the stock N64 controller. And so I just, and those Hori mini pads have gotten pretty expensive. And so I grabbed this, to, I just figured I was gonna check it out. I figured we would do an N64 live stream at some point, and that's when I would check it out. And so that's why it's still in the box, is I was just gonna wait and open it then. But uh, I mean, I bought this off Amazon. This is not some kind of weird uh, sponsored situation. And then the last thing, uh, gaming related, I just got this the other day, is uh, I got a copy of Electronic Games, and this is the only copy of Electronic Games that I have. Uh, Electric Electronic Games was a you know a, a gaming magazine that was around in the in the nineties. Uh, well, there was a version of Electronic Games around in like the early eighties, and then I don't I don't know how they use the same name or whatever, but uh, it came out again during sort of the sixteen and thirty two bit eras. But I wanted this particular issue just because of the cover. It's got Tom Kalinske on the cover, which I know some people don't like Tom Kalinske, and some people like me think that Tom Kalinske is pretty darned awesome. So um, I wanted to have it for that reason. I, I was thinking about trying to get uh, Kalinske to sign this for me, but uh, we'll see if I get around to doing that or not. But uh, if nothing else, maybe a Let's Read uh, someday. Might be fun to give that one uh, a flick through. So, okay, so that is it for everything that is not car related. So if you're only here for gaming stuff, uh, now is probably the time for you to consider uh, taking off or you can just hang out and see if maybe this isn't too terribly boring. Because uh, now what I'm gonna do, I have one package that I got from uh, one of you guys that is 100% car related. And then I'm just gonna talk about uh, some other Hot Wheels that I picked up along with uh, all the stuff that I picked up on my vacation, which was like a month and a half ago. So uh, the first thing I'm going to show is just the uh, the thing that I got sent. This is from Mike McFly, who I already mentioned, uh, with the Beavis and Butthead cover there. Uh, so Mike asked me on, on Discord, uh, you know, he said, you know, there's this, uh, the Senna, Senna McLaren is a Hot Wheel now, and he, he found one, you know, at a Target or whatever, and wanted to know if I wanted one. And I haven't seen one anywhere. And so I said, yeah, please. I, you know, of course I wanted to pay him for it. And, you know, I totally get it. I would be the same way. So, um, but I did offer to pay him. And uh, so he sent, I, I already opened it, but then I, I kept the packaging just to show uh, on camera here. So, uh, so there it is. And uh, we can go ahead and take it out as well. So this is a car that McLaren came out with uh, either this, late last year or this year. That's just meant to be a tribute to, uh, to Ayrton Senna. And uh, I don't need that anymore. Uh, so that there's the car. It's a pretty cool color, sort of a sort of a blue gray, kind of like my shirt, but my shirt has more blue in it. And um, yeah, it's got a decent amount of detail. So a uh, cool car. And so I knew he was sending me that, but uh, the other thing in the box was uh, a surprise and a cool one. And I mean, he of course uh, sent me a note, which I'm just not going to read to you guys. So I don't know how old this is, but certainly it's old. Uh, this is an old uh, Hot Wheel item. Let me just get it put together. So I don't, you know, like when I was a kid, I remember I had like a Hot Wheel car wash, and I think I had a little Hot Wheel like parking garage. And Hot Wheel sold a lot of this stuff, you know, because it was sort of like accessories for you to use to, you know, to play with your Hot Wheels. And so, uh, and this is definitely from that era, at least it certainly looks like it is. And that is a little Hot Wheel gas station slash mini market. See, it says uh, mini market there. Uh, and oh, maybe, I don't know if it's even supposed to have like a service station. Well, no, that's like a little walk up counter, so that's pretty cool. Well, it tells you how old it is. There's a guy talking on the payphone uh, right there. And, uh, and then over here, you've got some gas pumps. So, um, so yeah, I just, you know, I could I could so easily go down the rabbit hole of collecting Hot Wheels stuff, but I just can't because I just have too much stuff uh, as it is. But uh, but this was a really cool surprise, and I mean, both this and the Hot Wheel uh, were a very generous thing for you to send Mike. So um, so I really appreciate it, uh, Mike. By the way, Mike was the one for anybody who needs a little uh, memory jog. Uh, Mike sent me those wooden bowls. Remember, I was I described the wooden bowls from Sam's Town that people would eat the, the peanuts out of. And he sent me a couple of those, and my wife and I use those bowls to, uh, to eat popcorn out of. So, um, 
So next, uh, I guess I'm going to just show all the stuff that I got on my trip because it's really not that much stuff. And uh, and then we'll end with, because uh, I got a lot of little cars on my trip, and then we'll just end with the Hot Wheels that I've purchased for myself since I've been back. Uh, so as most people know, if you, you know, I've mentioned it, I think on the show, I certainly talked about it on the live stream and on Twitter. Uh, my wife and I took a vacation to France. And part of what we did while we were there is, uh, is we went to the Monaco Grand Prix. And, uh, before anybody says, Oh, money bags, uh, we got free tickets to the Monaco Grand Prix. And, uh, that's why we went. That was the whole purpose of the entire trip was we got two free tickets to the race, not because I have a YouTube channel. And so we, we'd like, well, you know, we can't let that opportunity pass us by. And uh, so we went, we spent like two weeks there and um, in various parts of France. And we even went uh, across the border into Germany uh, just for one day for reasons that I will um, make clear in a second. So um, while we were there, I like, I like going into like the newsstands and stuff. And uh, I did this while we were in France and while we were in Germany. I would just like, we'd be at the train station, right? And you're waiting for a train and there'd be a newsstand. And so you'd go in there. And of course, I would go check out the gaming magazines. And I was, it, it was interesting to see that uh, Retro Gamer, which is a magazine that I read, uh, there's a French edition and there's also a German edition. I really wanted to buy the German edition. And I saw it and I was like, oh, I'll get it later. And then I never got it, which I, I felt kind of bad about. But uh, instead, what I got, I thought this was pretty cool. Um, this is a French magazine and it's called Gamer Retro. So it's like a competitor to Retro Gamer because it's Gamer Retro instead of Retro Gamer, but they had both. So it is two different magazines and you see uh, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time uh, is on the cover. So I should mention, I, I don't speak French, so I, I can't like read this and tell you like, oh, this is saying whatever because I really, uh, I don't speak a word of French, which I'll just warn anybody if you're planning on taking a trip to France. Uh, they don't speak a whole lot of English over there, which is uh, pretty rare. Most countries in, in Europe speak English. Uh, the people speak English just fine, but uh, France, uh, they don't. But uh, I bought this. I just thought it was cool. I also bought it because it's smaller than uh, than a retro uh, gamer is, which is good for me because whatever I bought, I was going to have to carry around with me. And those retro gamers are pretty big. Like when I went to Great Britain a couple of years ago, I bought like a couple of retro gamers because uh, one of them was like one of their little compilation ones and they're heavy and like you're carrying that around for like a week and a half. So um, so I didn't really want to do that again. So uh, so I got this instead. And uh, so that's like pretty much the only gaming thing I got. Well, no, it's not. I got, where are they? I got two Saturn games, believe it or not. But uh, I kind of forgot about those until just now, but they're right here, so that's okay. So uh, at one point we were in Paris and we didn't know this when we booked the place, because, you know, we stayed at Airbnbs and stuff. Uh, but it turns out we were staying in Paris's Japan town, which I didn't even know Paris had a Japan town. And we were literally right around the corner from a book off, which if you don't know what a book off is, uh, it's this chain of stores that started in Japan where it's like new and used books, but then they'll also have like CDs, DVDs, and video games. And so once I saw that, I just figured, well, at some point I'm going to have to like, you know, pop over there real quick and see if they have anything cool. And they kind of did. So I got these two uh, games, uh, which I didn't have. So I'm trying to like kind of switch my whole Saturn library over to Japanese games. Um, I'm not getting rid of all of my U.S. games, but, you know, I don't want to buy any more U.S. games. I'd prefer to buy the Japanese versions. And so none, neither of these are anything that's going to like really flip your skirt up or anything. But uh, I got Virtua Fighter. Uh, I have the U.S. version of Virtua Fighter. and I have the pack-in version, which was a jewel case instead of that big monstrosity but I didn't have the Japanese version of Virtua Fighter. So um, that was pretty cool. And then the other one that I got is uh, Fighters Mega Mix, which I don't have any experience with Fighters Mega Mix, but I know that it's a well-regarded game. And uh, these were 10 euros a piece, which is like, you know, 11 or 12 bucks. So I didn't think that that was uh, too bad at all. Uh, so yeah, so sorry, I forgot about that stuff. So anybody that that clicked off the video when I said, if you only care about games, well, they just missed out on a cool magazine and two Saturn uh, games. So, uh, oh, well. So uh, what else? So we went to Monaco. I only got, you know, so this is kind of funny. So I we knew that a few days after the Monaco Grand Prix, we knew we were going to go to Stuttgart in Germany and that I was going to go to the Porsche Museum. And so I purposely didn't really buy anything at the race. Like, you know, because, you, you, you know, you can imagine you can buy all of like the team swag and I just didn't because I'm like, well, I'd really rather wait and get something at the Porsche Museum. 
And uh, so I don't have much to really show uh, from the race itself, but I, I mean, I do have some kind of cool stuff here. So, um, so uh, you know, they were given out earplugs, but it's kind of cool because they're, they have the uh, Automobile Club of Monaco uh, logo on them, and then they're in these nice little holders. So I always take earplugs with me when I travel, so now I have little official Automobile Club of Monaco uh, earplugs. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then uh, anybody that's traveled in Europe, or well, if you live in Europe, then of course you know this, is that even though they're all on the euro, every country mints their own euro coins. And so like the, the I mean, I don't know which is considered the obverse and which one's considered the reverse, but like one, so this is a two euro coin. So on one side, you just have, is it going to focus there? Uh, you know, it just says two and it has like the little relief map of Europe. And that's going to be the exact same coin no matter which country in Europe you go to. But on the other side, uh, it's going to be like country specific. But I wouldn't have thought that Monaco would have their own because Monaco is such a tiny, tiny country. But uh, there it is. And there's uh, Prince Rainier II. I assume that's Prince Rainier II. Uh, the current prince looks like him anyway. Uh, on uh, I don't like I said I don't know I don't know which side is considered the front and the back. I would consider that the obverse, which is the front, but I don't really know. But so so I grabbed a couple of those. I got them in change and I saw them and I, I threw them in my shopping bag so that I wouldn't accidentally spend them later. And um, uh, of course I got a program uh, from the race, uh, so that was pretty cool. Which really wasn't that ex yeah it was it was ten euros, which you know you can go to like an NFL football game. And you're not getting, I don't think, a program for only 10 bucks. They're going to charge you like 20 So uh, I was actually very surprised that just in general, uh, everything at the race was cheap. Like the food was pretty cheap. The beer was pretty cheap. Because like it's just in the middle of the city. And so anything that's normally open on, on a random Tuesday is open during the race. So you can just walk into a store and buy some beer and a sandwich and some chips uh, instead of like going to like, a, you know, at a, at a normal race or sporting event, you'd go to like a concession stand and pay like three or four times what something would normally cost. But here in Monaco, of all places, you know, it's like five euros and you get like a ham and cheese baguette and, you know, wash that down with a couple cold beers. So, uh, and then the only other things I got in Monaco, um, I got, you know, they, they were handing out these little maps. You know, it's like a little fold out map just so you, well, it's not even a map actually, it's just an advertisement, I guess. Um, well, oh yeah, because it's from the fan zone. The fan zone was pretty cool. They had a bunch of simulators you could play with in the fan. It was free to go in the fan zone, but in fact, I don't think you even had to have tickets to the race and you could go in the fan zone. And uh, there was all kinds of cool free stuff there. So, I mean, I have lots of stories I could tell about the weekend, about how awesome it was, but uh, I'm not, I won't. Um, but then this was the other thing I thought was cool. So I kind of, so I've only been to two different racetracks now. Um, like to see a race. I've been to Sonoma a couple times to watch the IndyCar race. And then uh, obviously I went to Monaco and watched the Monaco Grand Prix. So uh, one of the things that I, I've started doing is is collecting clag when I go to races. Clag, or if you're in Europe, they're called marbles, which is just um, the grippy compound on the tires comes off during the race. And so at the end of a race, there's all these little like boogers of really soft rubber all over the track. And so I just kind of reached down, like, you know, how Sergeant Horvath and Saving Private Ryan did that, like he had his little canister of dirt from everywhere that he went. So I'm kind of doing that with Clag. And so uh, we we were able to walk the track, the Monaco track, both days, uh, Saturday and Sunday. And so uh, I managed to grab, uh, I know it looks like poop, but it really is just rubber Clag. And this is from the hotel tunnel. So um, so that's pretty awesome. And then. And then that's it. Like, that's all I got in Monaco because I'm just like, no, I'm waiting to go to the Porsche Museum because, like, the, the Porsche Museum has a store in it and they sell a lot of little model cars, right? And so I'm like, no, no, I'm saving my money to load up on cars and uh, and or maybe get, like, some, some you know, a shirts or a jacket or, or Lord knows what. And so for that reason, I didn't buy anything uh, aside from what I just showed you which, I mean, the only thing out of all that stuff that I actually paid for was the program. And that's all I got in Monaco besides food. So, uh, so yeah, so that's it for that. And uh, I think everything else I'm going to talk about, with the exception of one thing, is uh, I got some CDs to show you randomly because I got them there, is, uh, is just little cars. So uh, 
so we stayed in Nice in France w- during the race because it's like a 15 minute train ride from Nice to Monaco. And uh, one of the days we were there, like there's this one, there's a part of Old Town Nice where every day it's a farmer's market, except for like Mondays. And then Monday, it's not a farmer's market. It's like an antique market. And so like my wife and I went to the farmer's market a couple times to buy food. And then when we found out that Monday was an antique market, we wanted to go check that out just to see like, well, what's an antique market like in Europe, you know? And, um, so I was looking around and I I mean, I'm, I was in complete motor racing mode for the whole trip. And so that's really what I'm looking for at this market is like motor racing stuff. And sure enough, there's this one guy where all he's selling is different model cars and I'm kind of checking them all out and like, yeah, this is cool. That's cool. Like whatever. And then one thing finally caught my eye and, uh, so it's, it's the only thing that I bought there. And let me see if I can get the, uh, the cover off. So, um, what is this Mike? I think it's micro champs. Yep. Micro champs brand. So I really like things that are like hot wheel scale. So, cause I don't have room for a whole lot else. And so I saw this, so this is a Williams Renault FW 15. You see that? So that is the last car that Alain Prost ever drove in F1. And he won the championship in this car in 93. And, uh, this was the year that Williams was sponsored by Sega. So I don't know if you're going to be able to see on the, the rear wing there, it says Sega. And then um, if you're not going to be able to see this probably, but if you can see where the driver's legs would be there, you can see Sonic the Hedgehog's legs. And that's what was really on the car. So uh, this is the, I don't know, anybody, there's like a famous picture. Uh, I think it was the Donington Grand Prix that Sega also sponsored. And so they had like a Sonic the Hedgehog trophy they gave out. And uh, that was the race that, that was like uh uh, Senna had, they called the lap of the gods, I think, where he passed five people on the opening lap to take the lead because it was raining. And then he won the race, even though the McLaren car that year was, was no good. And, um, so yeah, it was just a Sonic the Hedgehog thing. But so Sega was, I guess, investing some money in F1 that year. But, uh, so anyway, I just thought that that was really cool. And I don't remember what I paid for it, but I want to say it was like 12 euros. So like, I don't know, 14 bucks or something. So not, not really that much. And uh, so that's the only thing that I got uh, really while I was in Nice. Again, you know, we were trying to travel light. Like we didn't even check bags on the airplane. Everything was carry on, even though we were going for two weeks. So I just can't buy too much stuff because I have, you know, no way of carrying it. So I'm, I was trying to keep it light. So uh, so then we went to uh, uh, the Porsche Museum, right? The Porsche Museum was awesome. Like, all the cars they had in that museum, like, you know, all these old, they had this big Porsche 917 display because it was like the anniversary. So they had all these 917s in there. They had the original Pink Pig in there. And, uh, but then they also had uh, sort of the, the, the commemorative Pink Pig that they ran last year in the 24 Hours of Le Mans was also in there. So I saw two Pink Pigs. And then the Porsche 919 was in there. Uh, how many of you are still awake out there? They, they had all that stuff in there. I thought it was so, I took so many pictures in the Porsche museum. It was just like Porsche overload. And, uh, but then we were finally done looking around. And, uh, so we went into the gift shop, right? And so here's the thing. They have all these model cars, but they're all like 142nd scale, which is like that big. Like they're maybe twice as big as a hot, something like that. They're too big. They're, I, I don't, uh, I don't have room for that kind of stuff. They were also very expensive. Um, like it was like 40 or 50 bucks a piece, uh, cause they were really detailed. I mean, they're very nice models, but so I saw all those and I was like, oh, I just, you know, I almost bought a 919. Like that would be cool. If they had had the original pink pig that I would have bought, but they didn't. And so I ended up not really getting, uh, uh, any, mo- so I got two models there, which I'll show you, but so it was just funny because I didn't buy anything at the F1 race. Cause I'm like, no, no I'm going to wait for the Porsche museum. And then like, I didn't really buy anything at the Porsche museum either. So, um, so the only two cars that I got, one of them, I don't even really know anything about. Um, so the one I got for obvious reasons, uh, I got a Porsche Cayman. Uh, and, but you can see that this is not some kind of huge scale. This is actually smaller than a hot wheel. It's like smaller than a hot wheel, but bigger than a micro machine. And I mean, it says it's a Cayman S, but I mean, it's, you know, you can't really tell the difference, especially at this size. So, and it's like almost the color of my car, but not quite. So I thought that was cool. And this was like five euros. So like now you're talking. So I got that. And then the only other car they had 
that was small was this Porsche 906 from 1966. And I really don't know anything about this car. Uh, it certainly looks very cool. It looks like sort of a predecessor to the 917. But um, I bought it because it was small. And again, it was this was a little more expensive. This was 9 euros. So I ended up only spending like 14 euros. Uh, I think I spent more on coffee and a snack uh, at their little cafe than I did in the gift shop. But um, uh, well, then I also bought a car for a friend of mine. But but that's it. And uh, so yeah, so my only other hope that I had was uh, that towards the end of our trip, we went back to Paris for a few days, and right on the 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 Champs Elysees. I don't speak French. The, the you know you have the Arc de Triomphe on one side, and then the the Place de la Concorde on the other side. And that whole thing is the, the Champs-Élysées. That's like where, you know, the, the at the end of the Tour de France, they go and do a bunch of laps up and down the Champs-Élysées. And uh, it, there's just all these stores there. It's pretty ritzy as far as all the shopping. That's where, like, if you're, on, if you're like a shopping tourist, that's where they go because there's all these nice stores. And uh, one of the things they have there is a Renault store. And there I did find a few cool things. Uh, one thing is the shirt that I'm wearing, which is just this classic... Uh, see, so it says Renault Sport 1977. I think that's when they got into F1, maybe. Uh, I don't remember. But I just thought it was a cool uh, it was a cool polo shirt. And the funny thing is, they had all their F1 team stuff there. But anything F1 is so expensive. And they're not even really that nice. Like, you can buy, like, the F1 team polo shirt. And it's all just screen printed. So it's really not that nice. And it's, like, 80 bucks or something. And, like, this is, like, a nice proper polo shirt with, like, a sewn-on embroidered patch and it was like 30 bucks and I think it's a nicer shirt. So, so, uh, this is the only article of clothing I think that I bought, uh, the whole time I was on vacation, except for some socks. Cause we went there thinking it was going to be colder based on the weather forecast and then it ended up being really warm. So I was going to wear shorts, but all I had were like dress socks. I'm not going to, that's not a good look. And so I went to the store and bought like a bunch of like low cut athletic socks, but I mean, who cares? Uh, and so, yeah, so anyway, um, I bought four cars. Uh, at the reno store and oh i forgot i bought some cds we'll have to we'll have to go back to that in a minute but uh so i bought four cars these are all like roughly hot wheel scale they're a little bit bigger so i got a renault uh rs18 uh f1 car which i believe i'm trying to get the glare i believe that's last year's f1 car and uh, this is actually nico hulkenberg's car so um but yeah like i said i think this is last year's car not this year's car anyway Obviously, I'd prefer to have Danny Ricardo stuff, but um, he wasn't there last year. So uh, that's pretty neat. Uh, and then I don't even really know. This is Renault Sport RS01. I just thought it looked like a really cool, like, supercar. But I don't know anything about it. These were, I forgot how much, these were four euros 90. So they're pretty cheap. So, and then this one's kind of funny. I bought a Renault Clio, which is probably the most common car you see on the road uh, in France, which is just a little hatchback but i just thought it was funny just to get it uh because i kind of like hot wheels that are just like regular cars anyway but you know every other car in paris is a renault clio and then every other car is actually a, a like a motor scooter and then i kind of broke my rule uh because they had this and i thought it was neat uh, i got this uh renault rs01 it says renault rs011 but it's a 01 so i don't if someone out there knows better than me knows what the difference is like, there's a picture of what is on the box. Uh, and then we can open it real fast. We can try anyway. Uh, so this, I bought this because, uh, so this has a little bit of historical significance. Um, so this, I think this was driven by a guy named Jean-Pierre Jabouille. I don't, I don't speak French, man. But um, look, real, real ugly car, right? I, I hated these ground effect cars because they're just squares. Uh, because they wanted as much, uh, they wanted the floor of the car to be as big as possible because it's a ground effect car. So they were trying to direct more air under the car to create that vacuum under the car and suck the car down to the road. But uh, then what you have is an ugly car. Uh, so it's less downforce uh, up here and it's more downforce being caused by like suction underneath the car. And uh, I can't take it off of here because it's you have to undo two screws. I don't really care about this little pedestal thing but uh this is bigger than what i would normally buy but it's a pretty cool car i like the paint job and everything i just f1 cars were real real ugly during that period of time because again they were doing this whole ground effect thing uh yeah okay so 
Uh, that is it, I think, for things that I picked up on vacation. So you can see I really didn't buy very much stuff uh, on vacation, again, because I was just carrying it everywhere. And, uh, and so I didn't want to deal with that. But uh, so going back to that uh, toy store that in the Bay Area when I got uh, 1943, uh, I also picked up two cars that same day. And one of them is a Hot Wheel. And uh, that is coincidentally a Porsche 917. So I've just had a Porsche 917 kind of summer. So uh, and you see that one's got the uh, Gulf Racing uh, livery on it, even though it's white instead of blue. But uh, I think I actually may have seen this car at the museum. So that's pretty cool. If not, I saw one very similar. But so that was pretty cool. And um, I, I think I paid two bucks for it instead of a buck because I guess they thought it was like collectible. And then there's another one I got. This is this company Herpa, like not herpes, but Herpa, which I'd never heard of. I saw this was in a display case uh, and it just caught my eye because it's a Porsche 928. And I got a buddy who drives a 928. And so I saw this and I thought it was cool. And it even says in the packaging, uh, made in West Germany. And um, it says like, it says it in German, but it says precision model. So I'm like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And so I bought it and then I got it home and opened it. And like the thing's entirely plastic. And so I was kind of disappointed a little bit. It's, I mean, it's still cool. Don't get me wrong, but it's not as cool. I thought it was going to be metal, but uh, I guess I should have known the thing isn't very heavy. So, um, so that's that. And then, uh, oh, right, the CD. So this is the last thing. This is the one thing I did buy uh, on my trip where it's something I had to carry around, and it was kind of a pain in the butt. But, uh, you know, I think everybody by now knows that I'm a pretty big fan of craft work. And, um, but I really prefer listening to their music uh, in German uh, because they were popular here in the U.S. too, at least with, you know, certain, depending on what kind of musical genre you were into at that time, they were popular. And um, so they would translate all their lyrics into English and re-record them in English for sale here. And so any Kraftwerk CD you buy here is going to pretty much be in English. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm far from fluent in German, but I understand enough of it that sometimes the lyrics in English don't make a whole lot of sense. And I just think they sound better in German. So I always wanted to get uh, the CDs in German. I have them all on my iPhone, like in my iTunes library, but I didn't have the physical CDs because like down in the basement, uh, I have a little stereo system set up where I can listen to CDs. And then, you know, my car, I listen to CDs in my car because my car is old enough that um, I don't have Bluetooth or an auxiliary input or anything like that. So one of the things I wanted to do the one day that we were in Germany is I wanted to go to a, a store, like a record store, and find some proper German Kraftwerk CDs. And so I did that while we were in Stuttgart. And remember, I didn't spend hardly any money at the F1 race. I didn't spend hardly any money at uh, the Porsche Museum. And so I just really felt like uh, I'm just going to go into the CD store and let's just see what they have. And so I went into the store and they had one copy of every Kraftwerk album that there was, uh, except for the first two, because to most people, they don't count. So uh, I bought all of them but one. So uh, and so just real quick. So these these are all these digital uh, re, the, the remaster re-releases that they've put out. But these are all G CDs that are in German. Uh, so that's why I got them. So I got uh, Autobahn. These are in chronological order, by the way. Radioactivity. Trans Europe Express. Man Machine. Computer World, which is probably my favorite, and Tour de France, which uh, this one is not, uh, uh, this one's in French mostly, really. So this, if you buy this in the U.S. or buy it in France, I don't think there's, or buy it in Germany, rather, I don't think there's really any difference. The only one that I left was, uh, I left the mix, and I don't really know why I did that. Oh, I didn't buy Electric Cafe. Sorry, I didn't buy every album. I didn't buy Electric Cafe. And I kind of wish that I had. I don't really like that album as a whole that much, but there are songs on it that I like. So I should have gotten it, and I didn't. Uh, I don't. I was being cheap. I was like, well, I'm already buying this many. Because these were like, you know, 17, 18 euros a piece, so they weren't like cheap. And so I left that one, and I kind of wish that I hadn't done that. But um, uh, And then they also had the mix, and I didn't get that. And I felt bad about that. But then it's okay, because I came home, and I bought a German version of the mix on eBay for like a few dollars. And um, so this is not from my trip, but it's just I'm showing Kraftwerk CDs, right? So I got a German version of the mix. And then uh, this is their live album. 
uh, minimum maximum, which I've been kind of wanting this one for a while, but this one kind of sells for more than I want to pay usually on eBay. But I found like some Goodwill listing on eBay where they didn't even put craft work. It, the title literally just said minimum maximum and had a stock photo and it was like $8 shipped. So I was like, well, that's worth the risk. And I got it. And it's, you know, the little cardboard sleeve is not in the world's best condition, but the discs are fine. So I don't really care. So, uh, so that was pretty cool. So uh, the only things I have left is uh, a few more uh, Hot Wheels to show. So these are all Hot Wheels that I bought here uh, locally. Um, they came from Target. I didn't get them. So uh, this girl that I share an office with at work, she's also really into cars and into Hot Wheels. And so anytime she goes to Target, she checks the Hot Wheels. And if there's something cool, she'll take a picture and text me, like, hey, do you want this? And I don't know. She always hits the mother load and like I never find anything. So I don't know what's up with that. But, um, so these I haven't even opened yet, um, only because I was waiting to do this episode and I'm going to, I don't, I don't collect sealed Hot Wheels. So she got all four of these for me on just one trip, uh, to Target. And, uh, so we're just going to go through them real fast. Uh, I got a, a Pagani, uh, I don't even know how you say it as a Hyra, Huayra, I don't know how you say that, but it's a Pagani. And you see it's got like sort of a Brembo. Can you see what, I know there's a glare real bad. Uh, the Brembo livery there is kind of neat. And um, I got uh, a 2016 uh, Lamborghini Centenario Roadster. I'm not really super into Lamborghinis, but who's going to see that at Target and not grab it for a buck? You know, come on. So uh, I thought that one was pretty cool. Uh, I got this Aston Martin DB5. That one's okay. Again, it's a buck, right? So... You get them, check them out. You don't like them, find some kid and give it to him so he can go play in the dirt with it or, or give it to the thrift store or something. And then it's funny, this one is so long, it doesn't really fit in the packaging properly. I'm not a fan of these cars, really, but there's at no time will I ever see a Porsche Hot Wheel or Matchbox car and not want it. And so I got this uh, Porsche Panamera Turbo SE Hybrid Sport Turismo. So um, really neither the name nor the car itself fits in the packaging properly but uh that one's kind of cool i guess so I, I got all those from her on the same day and then like a few days later she texts me again that she's at a different target and she sees this which uh, i got pretty excited about because uh, this is one that i'd actually been keeping an eye out for but i uh, couldn't find it so this is one of these hot wheels premium cars so this is like a five dollar car instead of a one dollar car and uh it's from this silhouettes series and uh, that is a, a Porsche 930, but it's one of these RWB cars, the, the Rauvelt cars. So it's like, you know, had some like aftermarket stuff done to it. Uh, you know, Rauvelt is a real company that, that, that does this kind of like, well, I was going to say kind of like Singer, but really not at all like Singer. But uh, so these are these nicer Hot Wheels. They have more detail. They're 100% metal. Like now Hot Wheels have plastic bottoms, but this one's still metal. And then it actually has rubber tires which is pretty cool. So this is a lot more fun to drive this around your desk uh, than it is a normal Hot Wheel. So uh, so I thought that one was pretty cool. So, uh, oops. So yeah, so that's it for Hot Wheels. And I think that's actually it for everything. I'm just doing a quick lap around here. I had so much stuff, I had it spread out, but uh, I think that's it. So it's, that's you know gonna be over an hour long. So hopefully that's entertaining for some people. But uh, I really just wanted to make this video so I can put this stuff away. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, thank you so much to everybody that sent anything in, whether it was a postcard or anything else. Uh, I just, I love going to, going to the PO box and just, you know, I, when I get postcards in my PO box, it makes my day. Uh, I love hearing from you guys since I don't really get too many opportunities to meet you guys. Uh, as I said in the last live stream, uh, I'm going to, uh, Retro World Expo in Hartford, uh, another video game convention in, uh, in New Jersey, in Parsippany, New Jersey. And I'm going to the Sack Gamers Expo uh, here in Sacramento all uh, this fall. So uh, check and see if you're near any of those things, you're not doing anything that weekend, then come say hi. I'll have a booth and everything, and uh, you can come chat it up with me and whatnot. And it would be nice to meet people in person. So I'll try to uh, make another flashback episode soon. I already know what I'm going to talk about, too, and I just haven't done it yet. So um, hopefully I can get that done uh, pretty soon. And hopefully I can also do another live stream pretty soon. I really am just trying to get this uh, Dreamcast launch video done. So I'm kind of all in on that. But uh, other than that, uh, that's all I've got for today. So as always, thanks for watching. And I will see you guys again next time.